This is Nathan Radcliffe, and I'm sharing with you my sutraless almond bowel technique. Uh, this is performed at the New York Eye Surgery Center in the Bronx. Uh, I begin by making a limbal pyridomy about five millimeters posterior to the limbus between the superior and lateral rectus muscles. I'm trying to dissect a pocket about six millimeters wide. I'm avoiding all contact with the rectus muscles, and I want the pocket to be a little bit tight so that when the almond valve is placed inside of this area, uh, the tissue dissection will be limited and won't allow the plate to migrate. Similarly, I just created a small pocket for the patch graft that we'll be placing in a little bit. Uh, I've primed the almond valve, and now I'll be placing the almond valve in the supratemporal pocket. Usually use either a 0.3 or a 0.5 forcep along with a smooth tip forcep to place the valve in. Uh, while we're commonly taught to place an almond valve 8 to 10 millimeters behind the limbus, I'm really going to get it uh, as far back as I can. This will be past the orbital rim, and in fact the tension between the globe at about 10 millimeters and the orbital limb will keep the valve in place. Now I'm tugging on the tube tip. Uh, the tube wouldn't come forward, uh, so it's secure behind the orbital rim. Trim the tube. Uh, I anticipate placing the tube into the anterior chamber in a somewhat tangential manner. I have a curved 23 gauge forcep that has provis or some sort of cohesive viscoelastic loaded on it. Uh, I'm not going to make a corneal paracentesis because uh, I think usually it's not necessary. This is a pseudophagic patient. Uh, I'm going to place the tube through about a three or four millimeter tunnel here into the deep anterior chamber and again going tangentially across the anterior chamber. This is important for the sutureless technique because if the tube happens to migrate, it's not going to migrate into the visual axis and with a deep tube placement it won't migrate towards the anterior either. Uh, I'll now uh, go ahead and open up my 23 gauge flap there with the 0.12 forcep and use the smooth forcep to place the tube tip uh, into this tunnel. Uh, I want this fit to be tight, and as you can see here, uh, I'm actually using a curved forcep because if the, if the fit is very tight, uh, the curved forcep it does a better job of squeezing the tube to get it inside the tunnel. You can see it in the tube about a millimeter, and this tube isn't going anywhere. Okay, so there are no sutures uh, at this point, and I'm highly confident that the tube will not move and that the plate is going to stay behind the occlusion. Uh, if I had any movement of either of those two during the surgery or during my challenges, uh, I would simply suture them into place with either an 8 nylon uh, or perhaps a 7 viper suture. Here's a 4 millimeter by 4 millimeter scleral patch graft placed again in this pocket. Uh, and these simply don't migrate because there are no forces that would cause them to migrate. This is to seal glue being used um, around and above the patch graft. Uh, the patch graft is covering the tube entry site very well. Um, this patch graft is going to uh, prevent erosion. Um, you know, I'm, I'm closing this contemplative incision with glue uh, and Generally speaking, it won't open. If it were to open, it would reveal patch graft underneath, not uh, tube hung in. So uh, you could monitor that, and I've never had to uh, go back and seal one of these. And in fact, if we challenge right now with some injected uh, steroid and antibiotic, you'll see that we have a watertight seal uh, right here in front of the tube. So, uh, so the advantages to this technique are the patient will require less steroid to heal. The eye was obviously going to be less red, as you can see here as we're finishing. Uh, so it's more rapid visual recover, recovery and patient comfort.